Let's continue our discussion of diagnostic waste. In Fixing Healthcare 1.0, Module 2, we discuss sequential and iterative value streams and emphasize the importance of slicing out iterative value streams rather than mixing them in with simpler sequential value streams. Sequential value streams are used when the diagnosis has been made. This type of value stream allows the creation of specific prices for specific treatments. As examples, we discuss cataract and coronary artery bypass surgery. Iterative value streams, on the other hand, are used when the diagnosis has not been determined. And these value streams do not warrant a fixed price, but rather should be billed by the hour, similar to lawyer's fees. Iterative value streams require experts in medical diagnosis. As I discussed in module one, in the early phases of Mary's illness, she was not cared for by an expert. Her care was provided by a new rotating intern and an internal medicine attending who generally managed diseases that lent themselves to sequential care. As a consequence, delays in her diagnosis and treatment nearly proved fatal. It was only after I recruited an expert cardiology that Mary received the care she required. In addition to using illness scripts in creating a tiered diagnosis, diagnostic experts apply Bayes' theorem. After assessing the pretest probability of different diseases that take into account the sensitivity and specificity of tests, they will order. They use these three values to determine the post-test probability and to decide how helpful a specific test will be for determining the final diagnosis. Let's dice or dissect the steps that an expert uses in creating an efficient and effective iterative value stream. A, first the expert determines the pretest probability of each possible diagnosis. Next, B, decides on the test to help with the diagnosis. And C, researches the sensitivity and specificity of that test. Next, D, he or she reviews the result. And E, determines the post-test probability of the diagnosis. How much did the result of the test increase or decrease the probability of the diagnosis being considered. In other words, what is the post-test probability? Bayes' theorem is difficult to calculate by hand, but fortunately there is a free app. Uh, just search for Bayes' theorem at the App Store and you will find it. Unfortunately, I have looked at, through the internet for an online computer uh, uh, program that also calculates. I have not as yet found one, so I recommend the phone app. As I will show, when, you, when a pretest probability is between 30 and 70 percent, the test is and the test is reasonably sensitive, 90 to 95 percent, and specific, 80 to 85 percent. These tests will provide a helpful change in the post-test probability, and experts know that these tests will be of value. Experts continually ask, "What will I do differently in response to a positive or a negative result?" If the answer is nothing, they don't order the test. Tests are usually not helpful for confirming a disease that is highly likely for, or for excluding a diagnosis that is very unlikely. An exception to this rule may be made when an unlikely diagnosis is life-threatening. However, this rationalization is too commonly invoked and should be used with caution. Also, if a patient will be receiving a toxic treatment or will have therapy, therapy that is tailored depending on the specific result, highly probable diseases may need to be confirmed by testing. Now let's give Bayes' theorem app a try. Let's look at a disease in tier two with a pretest probability of 50%. Let's order a test with a 98% sensitivity and a 95% specificity. Many modern tests actually achieve these values. Then we hit run. If the test is positive, it will increase the probability of this disorder from 50% to a post-test probability of 95%, moving it from tier two to tier one and making the diagnosis highly likely. A negative test would reduce the probability of this disease to 2%, 
making it highly unlikely. Clearly, this test would be of great benefit in clarifying the diagnosis. Now let us return to our, our case of the 34-year-old female with fever, chills, nausea and vomiting, dysuria, flank pain, and tenderness, as well as suprapubic tenderness. The most likely diagnosis was pyelonephritis. And here were the tests that the expert ordered. Now let's apply Bayes' theorem to the urine and blood cultures. Because the pretest probability was very high, positive tests do not significantly change the probability of this diagnosis. As shown in the upper right image, these positive tests only move the probability from 95 to nearly 100%. However, the cultures provide a specific organism responsible for her infection, E. coli, and therefore these tests should be ordered. But how about the renal ultrasound? As shown in the right lower hand image, patients with pyelonephritis have approximately a 5% chance of having an anatomic abnormality such as hydronephrosis. The ultrasound has a 90% sensitivity and a 95% specificity. A positive test moves the post-test probability to nearly 50% and would encourage a CT scan of the abdomen to confirm and better define the abnormal ultrasound. And a negative test virtually excludes the diagnosis of an anatomic defect reducing the probability to nearly 0%. Thus, by applying Bayes' theorem, the expert can make a definitive diagnosis. To summarize, experts utilize illness scripts and pattern recognition to narrow the possibilities and to focus their diagnostic testing. They then use Bayes' theorem to decide on the most beneficial diagnostic tests and to assess the post-test probability of the diagnosis. This approach assures high value care. Value equals quality divided by cost. Using this approach, they quickly achieve a diagnosis, high quality care, using the minimum number of tests, reducing cost. Health care delivery can no longer afford the shotgun approach to diagnosis. I think you all now realize that our patients deserve diagnostic experts. Thank you.